Mount Tabor is, is, is in the southern part of Galilee in this big flat plain, and it just kind of rises up from the flat plain, almost a perfect sphere of, 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 this, of this mountain. It's about a 2,000 foot climb, and at the top is a beautiful 360 degree view of, of every direction. And I remember being there at the top of Mount Tabor when I went on pilgrimage as a seminarian to the Holy Land, and it's just, just uh, uh, something to, be, to look out in the same way that, that our Lord and, and Peter, James, and John did. And I think as you know me by now, one of my favorite things to do is hiking. And, and one of the, the less favorite things to do is actually climbing mountains, like climbing up hills and stuff like this on a steep climb, even though you get a, you get a nice view at the end. But I was, I was wondering what it was like for Jesus. You know, he probably had those perfect knees and perfect cardiovascular system, and he, could probably, he was probably way out in front, and the apostles are kind of huffing and puffing behind him. Um, that was where I would be. Um, and when they get to the top, the, the apostles kind of, they, they, they drift off to sleep. You know, it's probably a, t- a tough climb. Maybe he had some beef jerky, had some trail mix, and then uh, started to fall asleep from the, from the climb. And I imagine the Lord, too, was, was moved by that mountain height, the beautiful vista, the closeness to heaven, the nearness to the Father. He prays up there. And in his prayer, his true identity as the eternal Son is revealed. The deep reality of who he is, that he is God. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance and his clothing became dazzling white. And the apostles, they're aroused by this sight. And this is different than anything else they've ever seen, right? They've seen our Lord do some amazing things, right? They've, the blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk. Demons have been, have been expelled. People have been, even been raised from the dead. But they haven't seen anything like this. And they're dazed and overwhelmed by this incredible sight. And traditionally... One of the main reasons our Lord allows these three chief apostles to witness the transfiguration is to prepare them for the scandal of the passion. In fact, St. Leo the Great writes that this is the, the, the great reason for this. They were on their way to Jerusalem, where they would see their beloved master and Israel's promised Messiah King be betrayed, arrested, tortured, humiliated, crucified, and killed. This mountaintop vision of his transcendent power as God, of who he really is, was, was to sustain them in that dark hour. And in fact, there's one tradition that, that, that holds that the transfiguration happens 40 days before Good Friday. But there's a second important reason for the transfiguration, and one that's implicit in the mystery. And that is this. In Jesus' transfiguration, he shows those three apostles and us who we are and what we we were created to be. The transfiguration reveals tangibly the promise of, of who and what we are going to become if we stay with Jesus. We human beings are made to look like that. And the reason God created and redeemed us was so that we could live in intimate communion with him in heaven forever. He wants us to make us like him. The meaning of being human is to be divinized, caught up in the life and mystery of the triune God. To be human is to be close to God, to be with him and being made like him. As we find in the Gospel of St. Matthew, as our Lord says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So in his transfiguration, Jesus is showing our true identity as well. And this, uh, this, this part of the mystery reminds me of this beautiful scene in C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story if you've never read it. It's, pr- it's really short. You could probably read it in a few hours. 
And it's a kind of allegory about purgatory and inspired undoubtedly by Dante's Divine Comedy. And in the, the whole story is about the narrator who travels from hell to heaven. Well, in chapter 12, the narrator is taken to the border of heaven where he sees this woman approaching. And she's surrounded by these bright spirits dancing around her like, like a massive emeralds. And there are boys and girls dancing about her and, and throwing flower petals uh, in her path. And this intense and beautiful light shines out of her. And the, the narrator says, and only partly do I remember the unbearable beauty of her face. So intense, so overwhelming. And then he asks his guide, he says, is it, is it? The woman is so radiant and beautiful, you're thinking what? That it's the Blessed Virgin Mary coming to him. And the guide says, no, not at all. It's someone you'll have never heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. This radiantly beautiful woman with the divine life shining out from her was an ordinary humble housewife from some... some suburb in London. And the story goes on to explain what, that during her earthly life she was married to a difficult, little, self-pitying, dramatic husband, I'm sure there's nobody here by that description, <laughs> who made her life unhappy. But, but now the angels serve her, and all these little boys and girls dance, dance about her honoring her. They're her sons and daughters, not by blood, the guide describes, but every young man or boy that met her became her son, even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. And finally, the narrator describes in a beautiful sort of way that he says this, love shone not from her face only, but from all her limbs, as if it were some liquid in which she had just been bathing. Love shone not from her face only, but from all her limbs, as if it were some liquid in which she had just been bathing. This humble, unknown woman in a bad marriage, who probably wasn't much to look at in life, who wouldn't be noticed, who was worn out by the cares of the world, now we see her in heaven as in the glorious fulfillment of who she was created to be, bright and shining totally immersed in the love and the life of God. Our Lord's transfiguration invites us to look around the church here and to realize, although they may not be much to look at now, that is what God made them to be. And look into your own soul and realize that is what God made you to be. That is your destiny. Now close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself with Jesus in heaven. That the divine love shining out not only from your face, but from all your limbs, as if it were some liquid in which you had just been bathing. The Lord is telling us in the transfiguration, this is who you are. This is who you are supposed to become. That's an incredible message of good news for our troubled and confused times. You know, most of the serious questions that currently face the human race and many of the moral issues so hotly debated turn on one fundamental question. Who and what is a human being? Who are we? What is the point of our lives? What are the limits and the possibilities? What makes for our happiness, our dignity, and our true freedom? We have developed an unprecedented power to transform the stuff of reality, whether it be scientific technologies or sophisticated social and psychological engineering. 
That massive potency is pressing on the human race in, in, in new and momentous ways. And among some people, it sparks dreams of helping our fallen nature become more human. In others, it sparks a nightmarish vision of redefining and recreating humanity in their image and likeness or according to some ideology, bringing about a future in which all that is truly human will be put at risk. And these questions and considerations are what we call anthropology. That is, what we believe about the human person as to who we are, where we came from, where are we going, what are we supposed to be doing right now? Are we created by a loving God, or are we simply a cosmic accident? Are we defined by a God-given nature that was given to us in love and with a purpose, or are we left to ourselves to define ourselves? Are we destined for greatness and glory, or doomed to a relatively short existence on earth, only to fade and disappear? These questions matter. We can take the example of our digital technology, which has accomplished great good in communication and medical help and all sorts of other, other ways. You know, it's one of the reasons that we're told that why the, the people in the Ukraine are holding out is because they're getting real-time, massive amount of intelligence at the right time. But when it comes to creating an alter alternative world that is not real, with a deficient view of being human. Like, let's be honest, Zuckerberg's metaverse. It is forming us in an anthropology that is not good, reducing us to pixels on a screen or Marxist cogs in the wheel of some twisted collective or of the derivative anthropologies taught by critical theory or transgenderism. And that's why it's so good for us, especially as children, to be engaged with the real world, to being outside, of playing, turning off the electronic devising and interacting with the real world. That's why I learned by spending time in the wilderness, you learn very fast that it's not a world you created, it's a world that you adjust to and, be, and get formed by. What Jesus is revealing to us is so much better and so much more beautiful than any other option that's out there. And this is, you know, in this struggle too, this is one of the reasons why now we've implemented in our school the Rua Woods Theology of the Body curriculum to help our young people get formed throughout their, their elementary and middle school years to what it means to be human. When Jesus reveals himself as truly God and truly man, his human nature fully irradiated with his divinity, shining forth in breathless power and glory, he's not only, again, showing his disciples who he is, he's also showing them who they are and supposed to become. Who are we? We are made by a loving God for love made in his image and likeness, and we are called to become like God and live with him forever in heaven. I think St. John remembered that bright vision of the transfiguration when he wrote in his first letter, Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So two practical applications of this for our life. The first comes from the letter to the Romans, where St. Paul says, says this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. I consider that the sufferings of the present time, which can be considerable, are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed in us. Wow. What does that mean? That means we need to keep the goal in mind in our daily decisions. 
remembering the end and the goal of our lives. To be human not, means not to be glorified and content and secure in this life. We are not meant to settle down here to build tents, as St. Peter suggested. We are, our citizenship is in heaven. We are to become like Jesus in this world by taking up our cross and following him. And so I make hard choices now for the sake of the glory to be revealed. I deny myself now for what I know God made me for. I endure the furnace now for the sake of the fire of life and love that I will know in heavenly glory. And if I am to be divinized, then I need to act like Jesus today. You know, Sister Miriam told us over and over in the mission, now is the time. And so with that awesome hope in view, right, that calling to be glorified with Jesus in our humanity, a greater hope can't even be conceived. And so let's not be deceived by the limited and often lying visions of what it means to be human and of earthly utopias promised by Marxism, materialism, or secularism. They will only bring about some horrible dystopia that dehumanizes us. Better for us to listen to the divine Son of God and to learn from Him. He knows who we really are. He made us. He loves us. The second practical thing is this. Just like the apostles hiking up Mount Tabor, you only get to the transfiguration by climbing a mountain. And so we do the work of climbing daily, one step at a time, not only through our Lenten practices, but but all the time, with that little spiritual reading, that little time set aside for scriptural reflection and meditation, those little acts of charity, those little acts of self-denial and penance, praying a daily rosary, mass every Sunday and holy day without exception. But the fastest way up the mountain comes to us from St. Therese. You know, when she was a girl, she had her first experience of an elevator, and it blew her away. How could you go up, get up so high, so fast, with so little effort? She says, that's her little way of unshakable trust and confidence in God's love for her. And that was the message of Sister Miriam's mi mission, essentially. When we allow the Lord's love to enter into our lives, that's getting on the elevator up the mountain. And if you didn't get a chance to hear Sister Miriam, the, her talks are now posted on our website and on the YouTube channel. In fact, the Archdiocese just sent out the, the links to the whole Archdiocese so that other people could share in what we were blessed with. That's the fastest way up the mountain, the elevator of divine love. And so whatever struggle we have in, in going up the mountain to, to witness the transfiguration, we remember that the sufferings of the present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed in us. And it's worth it. It's worth it. The transfiguration reveals who our Lord is in his glory. And he reveals who we are the glory that we are called to as well.